Hi there. You're listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast, Episode 73, The Seleucid Empire, The Anabasis of Antiochus the Great. Antiochus' loss to Ptolemy IV at the Battle of Raphia was certainly humiliating, and not exactly what the young king envisioned as the promising start to his brilliant career. If there was a silver lining to it all, he did manage to recapture the city of Seleucia by the sea, and the treaty provided assurance that the Syrian border was safe from an Egyptian invasion. Issues regarding the security of his empire as a whole remained, however, as Antiochus feared the defeat at Raphia could cause his soldiers to lose faith in him and switch their loyalty to a rival claimant to his crown, Achaios, the self-proclaimed king of Asia Minor. A member of the important family of Achaius the Elder, the younger Achaius possessed a reasonable claim to the Syrian throne, and already attempted to invade in 219, before being forced back by a mutiny among his soldiers. Since the failed insurrection against Antiochus, he had busied himself by becoming involved in the political squabbles of Anatolia, as both an arbitrator and outright conqueror, ruling from this former Seleucid capital at Sardis. He assisted the city of Pednalissus in the Antalya province in southern Turkey against attacks by the city and peoples of Selgi, who were placed under the yoke and forced to pay an indemnity, thus expanding Achaius's political reach along the Ionian coast. The city-state of Rhodes looked to court an alliance with the king against Byzantium by arranging for his reunion with his father Andromachus, who was captured during the Third Syrian War and held as a prisoner in Alexandria. In spite of the circumstances with his father, Achaios and the Egyptian government had likely been in cahoots since just before he revolted against Antiochus. He was married to a daughter of Mithridates of Pontus, the sister of Laodice III, and with his strength and position, soon he began to threaten the other rulers of the region, including Prusias I of Bithynia. Chief among Achaius' rivals in Asia Minor was Attalus of Pergamon. The two had been battling since Achaios took over operations following the murder of Seleucus III in 223, with Attalus losing his territories barring Pergamon itself. Desperation compelled the Attalid king to try recruiting Galatian tribes to march against Achaios, but the attempt nearly backfired after the superstitious Celts refused to do so due to an eclipse. Yet the solution to his problem soon came from the most unexpected of places, Antiochus III himself. There was no love lost between the Attalids and Seleucids, who held a complicated relationship throughout the 3rd century, but Antiochus sent a message to Attalus in late 217, asking to put aside their differences on account of their mutual foe. On this, the Pergamene king agreed, and both would coordinate a joint military operation in the spring of 216. Unfortunately, the narrative for 216 through 215 is lost, but we know that the seleucid adelid coalition was able to make great progress against Achaios, who was pushed back to Sardis and placed under siege by 214. As a provincial capital for both the Persians and Seleucids, Sardis was heavily fortified, and was able to resist for over a year as many troops on both sides were killed in ambushes and counterattacks. Most in the Seleucid camp believed that only starvation would compel the Sardians to surrender Achaios, but an observant officer named Lagoras of Crete was able to determine that one of the walls of the city was unguarded, thanks to the behavior of local carrion birds who feasted on the many dead bodies that littered the moats below, and rested freely on those ramparts after having their fill. After being informed of this situation, Antiochus requested that Lagoras, Theodotus of Aetolia, and Dionysius the bodyguard exploit the opportunity. On a dark and moonless night, the trio of officers and a handful of troops were able to bring ladders up to the wall and saw at the hinges of the nearby gates, while Antiochus raised a commotion at one of the entrances on the opposite end of the city. Achaios and his commanders were none the wiser, until the din of 2,000 Seleucid soldiers storming through the undefended portion of the settlement made it clear that much of the city was lost. Achaios tried to rally his men, but was forced back to the Acropolis, where he would make his final stand as Sardis was brutally sacked by Antiochus's men. With Achaius trapped in the Acropolis, who should come to his rescue but none other than Sosibius, the chief minister of the Alexandrian court of Ptolemy IV? Despite the Treaty of the Fourth Syrian War forbidding any direct aggression between the Seleucid and Ptolemaic houses, Sosibius did not want to lose a useful ally against Antiochus's interests in the region, 
so he commissioned a Cretan named Bolus to help smuggle Achaios out of Sardis with a generous ten-talent payment up front, with the promise of more upon completing the rescue. Weighing his options and chances for success, Bolus chose to contact a fellow Cretan in the Seleucid camp and offered to split Sosibius' advance, along with any rewards gained should they deliver their quarry to Antiochus. With a plan in order, Bolus was soon able to sneak his way into the Sardian necropolis and met up with the grateful Achaios. In one of the following evenings, Bolus and a few complicit partners led Achaios down a secret path from the fortification, devoid of any patrols. For but a brief moment, the former ruler of Sardis began to relax and embraced his newfound freedom. But then the Cretan whistled loudly, and a company of Seleucid guards came pouring out of the darkness with their weapons drawn, while Bolus apprehended Achaios and had him tied up and brought to the king's tent. Antiochus, who had already been informed of Bolus's plan and remained awake throughout the night from anticipation, was reportedly shocked to see the state of his rival, bound and gagged before his feet like a common criminal. Contemplating the fickleness of fortune, the Seleucid king was said to have openly wept, yet this did not sway his sense of vengeance against the would-be usurper. After some deliberation between Antiochus and the royal council, Achaius was given a terrible punishment. For his crime of treason, Achaius had his limbs cut off, his head decapitated, and whatever was left was sewn inside the skin of a donkey, before being crucified by the end of 213. Like with the body of Molon, the treatment of Achaius was intended to be as shockingly gruesome as it was humiliating, a warning to all that wished to defy the authority of Antiochus. With the death of Achaios, Antiochus had destroyed the final challenger to his crown, and was now free to enact his ultimate plan, a restoration of the Seleucid Empire. This would be achieved through the launching of a great expedition into the east, an anabasis, or march up country, a military campaign intended to forcibly reintegrate the wayward satrapies that had broken away during the troubled reigns of his forefathers. Like with their Achaemenid predecessors, the sheer size of the empire required that Seleucid monarchs remained almost constantly on the move, traveling throughout the various provinces and asserting their authority over the land and its peoples. In contrast to the Persians, however, the Seleucids were more culturally and politically tied to the Mediterranean, and much of their attention was focused on combating their rivals like the Ptolemies over control of Syria and Asia Minor. While this may have been initially addressed by delegating oversight to junior co-rulers or local dynasts and officials, some of these satrapies had not personally seen a Seleucid king in over 50 years, providing an opportunity for rebellion by disaffected locals or ambitious governors. Eastern expeditions were an established precedent in the dynasty's history, such as Seleucus I's reconsolidation of Alexander's wayward satrapies in the 300s and the unsuccessful campaigns of Antiochus's father, Seleucus II, in the 230s, but they demanded a large amount of time, resources, and manpower. According to Justin, 100,000 infantry and 20,000 cavalry would take part in the anabasis of Antiochus. While certainly an exaggeration, the claim may not be completely in the realm of fiction. With Achaius dead and the treaty with Ptolemy in place, Antiochus did not have to worry about keeping large garrisons on his western borders, and could commit the majority of his troops to the campaign. Given the amount of soldiers required for such an undertaking, this would have also cost an extraordinary amount of money to supply and equip them for at least a few years. This was to be the largest military undertaking of the Hellenistic world in almost a century, and would be recognized as a significant event by later writers and historians. Polybius remains our chief source, but his account of the Anabasis is heavily fragmented, since the surviving books of his histories only covers events down to the end of the Fourth Syrian War. Antiochus would begin his Anabasis in 212 by leading his army into Armenia, ruled by Xerxes I of the Arontid dynasty. Following Alexander's death, the Arontids appear to have been relatively independent from the affairs of the early Hellenistic period. It is unclear what sort of relationship they had with the Seleucids, but we know that Xerxes' father, Arsames, had sided with the usurper Antiochus Hyrax against Seleucus II, 
but was defeated and received some sort of indemnity. This was still not paid off at the time of Xerxes' accession to the throne, providing the necessary justification for Antiochus to invade. Armenia was also quite wealthy, and bred some of the finest horses in the known world, an invaluable asset for any military commander preparing for a major campaign. When we are dropped into Polybius' narrative, Antiochus had already laid siege to the capital of Arsamosata, near the modern Turkish city of Elazigh, where the Armenian royal army had fortified itself. Xerxes managed to escape the settlement, but feared that if Arsamosata fell, then his position would be threatened by internal rebellion on account of his perceived weakness, and so he offered to set up negotiations with Antiochus to try and retain his kingship. Most of the royal friends advised Antiochus that it would have been better to install a new puppet on the throne, but the Seleucid decided to keep Xerxes as a vassal ruler, and even offered to waive the remaining indemnity that was owed by his father. In return for the right to retain his crown, Xerxes gifted the king 300 silver talents, 1,000 Armenian horses, and 1,000 mules prepared for the baggage train. And to cement this alliance, Antiochus married his sister Antiochus to the Orontan monarch. By the end of the year, Antiochus left Armenia and marched south into Mesopotamia, where he spent the entirety of 211, presumably in either Seleucia on the Tigris or Babylon. We aren't really sure what he was doing at this time, but the fragment of Polybius gives a digression on the Euphrates River, suggesting that he was in the region. He was likely assembling the full force of his Anabasis and gathering necessary resources to fund his expedition, including the stripping of about 4,000 talents worth of silver and gold from the Temple of Aini in the former Persian palace of Ekbatana. It also appears that he was preparing to spend a long time away from his imperial heartlands, getting his affairs in order before the army embarked on their journey. According to a Babylonian tablet, he elevated his 11-year-old son Antiochus to the position of co-ruler. Under the guidance of his mother Laodike and the loyal advisors, the boy king would be a useful deterrent against possible insurrections in Syria, or could be called upon to assume the throne should his father be killed in the east. With the full complement of his army present, the expedition passed through Media in the spring of 210, destined for the lands of Parthia along the southeastern coast of the Caspian Sea, the area on the border of Iran and Turkmenistan. Around 246, Parthia was invaded by a tribe from the Eurasian steppes known as the Parni, led by their king Arsakis I. As the eponymous founder of the Arsakid dynasty, he killed the local Seleucid governor and took the title of king, with the Parni now becoming synonymous with the name Parthian. Seleucus II attempted to retake the satrapy in the mid-230s, but after an initial victory, he was defeated in a second battle by Arsakis, who was able to retain his position as a Seleucid-approved subordinate as evidenced by coins minted under Arsaki's authority that carry the title Autocrator instead of Basileos. Since then, the Arsakids had taken major steps in building up the region as the seat of their power, fortifying and establishing cities as they settled in the role as leaders of local sedentary communities. It would have been in Antiochus's best interest to humble this growing threat on his northern borders, and since Arsakis I had died in roughly 211 and was replaced by his son, Arsakis II, any treaties could have been considered null and void. The chance to wipe away the stain of a past defeat would have merely sweetened the deal. To ensure his entrance into western Parthia, Antiochus intended to make a crossing of the arid deserts of northern Iran. Arsakis was surprised by the boldness of the Seleucid king and feverishly tried to destroy the wells and cisterns that provided the only reliable source of water in the area. But Antiochus had already dispatched a junior officer commanding a body of horsemen to prevent the sabotage of these wells, before reaching and seizing the capital of Hecatompolis in the Semnon province. Arsakis and the rest of the Parthians had moved north into the region of Hyrcania, presumably with the intention to draw the king deeper into the countryside through the only available route, the Alborz Mountains. Along the main pass known as Mount Labus, the Arsakid erected several barricades and posted small garrisons to ambush Seleucid troops as they struggled to make their way through the mountains. Given that the core force of Antiochus' army was the slow-moving phalanx, and were followed by an undoubtedly large baggage train, they could be easy targets for the more mobile Parthians when forced into such a narrow defile. To compensate, Antiochus organized several small groups made of missile troops, 
light infantry, and mountain warfare experts. These units would act as both a scouting force and screen for the rest of the army, able to climb and maneuver their way through the more dangerous footpaths and drive off the Parthian ambuscades. Army engineers would follow behind, clearing out the debris and barriers to allow the phalanx to make the slow march through the pass. After eight days, Antiochus and his men reached the summit, where they found the army of Arsakis waiting a raid out on the open plain. Deploying his own troops for battle, Antiochus' phalanx kept the Parthian foot soldiers at bay, but were likely having a harder time dealing with the horse archers. Following several hours of repeated contests, the Parthians realized that a group of Seleucid skirmishers were attacking the back of their line, having snuck around the summit along the cliffsides the night before. The Arsakid army quickly broke rank and escaped through the descent behind them into the grasslands of Hyrcania. Antiochus had to go to great effort to prevent his men from chasing after the fleeing Parthians, for it could have been a feigned retreat intended to bait them into a trap. With the battle over, the Seleucid army continued their march to Hyrcania in an organized fashion. Near the descent was the city of Syrinx, a capital of the satrapy, and a large body of Parthian troops barricading themselves within the impressive fortifications of the settlement. Antiochus placed the site under siege, and the subsequent fighting was relentless. Bodies of the dead from both sides piled up and were left where they fell, and the Seleucid sappers went into hand-to-hand -hand combat with Parthian defenders in the tunnels dug out underneath the walls. Apparently, the Greek settlers of Syrinx, descendants of the original colonists of Alexander or Seleucus, were massacred by the Parthians, lest they decide to open the gates in favor of a Hellenic king. Yet this act of brutality did nothing to stop Antiochus' advance, for his engineers managed to bring down one of the walls using underground tunnels. The Parthian troops inside tried to beat a hasty retreat, but were caught by a Seleucid patrol and driven back into the city, where they soon offered surrender. Unfortunately, Polybius' narrative cuts off here. Arsakis does not seem to have been at Syrinx, but he must have come to terms with Antiochus shortly after the city's fall, since Justin explains that the Arsakid ruler was, quote, taken into alliance, and remained on his throne as another vassal king. For now, the Parthians were placed under the Seleucid yoke, but Antiochus was not yet finished. He now turned to Bactria, the so-called Land of a Thousand Cities, a prosperous and heavily populated region encompassing much of Afghanistan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. At around the same time as the invasion of the Parni into Parthia, the father and son pair of Diodotus I and II declared themselves kings over Bactria and the rest of Greek-controlled Central Asia. The Diodotids are traditionally seen as rebel satraps declaring independence in the face of Seleucid weakness, but it is quite possible that they were Seleucid agents given a greater amount of autonomy and the right to mint of their own coinage. Diodotus II does not appear to have fought against Seleucus II during the latter's anabasis, so it is unclear as to where exactly they stood. By 225 or so, the Diodotids were overthrown by a man known as Euthydemus, the eponymous founder of the Euthydemid dynasty. Diodotus may very well have been approved by Seleucus II, but no such authorizations were extended to Euthydemus, whose seizure of the area would have jeopardized a wealthy part of the Seleucid dominion. In his recounting of the Bactrian campaign, Polybius abruptly begins during Antiochus' siege of an unknown city in early 208, whereupon the Seleucid king received news from his scouts regarding the location of Euthydemus and his army. The Greco-Bactrian ruler must have been keeping close tabs on the movement of the Seleucid invasion force, and hoped to keep it from breaching the interior of his kingdom in the floodplains of the Oxus River, the Amudaria. Antiochus and his army were still in the lands of Arya in western Afghanistan, as marked by the Arius River, the modern Hari Rud. Euthydemus planned to halt the Syrian king's march by stationing 10,000 cavalry at a ford in the river to guard against his entry. But the scouts of Antiochus were able to provide a valuable piece of information. These horsemen would only guard the river in the daytime, and retire by night to a nearby settlement, leaving a window of opportunity to make a crossing. Abandoning the siege, Antiochus led his army on a march for two days before leaving them behind instead choosing to bring along his cavalry, skirmishers, and silver shields on a night march to the Arius River. His information was proven to be correct, and a large portion of the army was able to ford the river by the dawn without incident. 
Before the rest could make it through, some Bactrian scouts making their way to the riverbank were stunned to see the sudden arrival of the Seleucid army, and raced back to their camp to alert the rest of the force. A cloud of dust and the thundering of hooves of thousands of horses loomed on the horizon, but the king realized that many of his soldiers were not yet prepared to form up for battle. Gathering a thousand riders from the Agema and Hatairoi, Antiochus looked to buy time for his still-crossing troops by leading his horsemen against the approaching Bactrian cavalry. As the first wave of Bactrians moved against them, Antiochus and the rest of the Seleucid lancers charged through their lines. To bolster the resolve of his men against a numerically superior force, the king courageously threw himself into the thick of battle, fighting harder than his peers to ensure they stood beside him. The disciplined Seleucid cavalry were able to drive off this initial wave, but exhaustion and attrition soon set in as a second and third round of Bactrian riders began to take their toll. Antiochus' bravery also came at a price. Not only was his horse killed from underneath him, but a glancing blow from a Bactrian weapon hit the king in the mouth, knocking out several of his teeth in the process. Just as the tide seemed to be turning against Antiochus, the Seleucid officers and the newly arrayed troops were able to come to the defense of the king driving the Bactrians off the battlefield. With news of the defeat at the Arius, Euthydemus was reportedly terrified at the prospect of facing off against Antiochus in another open battle, and endeavored to make a retreat to the capital city of Bactra, modern Balkh in northern Afghanistan. For nearly two years, Antiochus would lay siege to Bactra, a testament to the settlement's fortification and defenses. We once again lose Polybius during this time, though we can assume that the Seleucid army was not exclusively devoted to the siege, and no doubt some form of pillaging or battles with local Bactrians must have transpired, but we cannot say anything for certain. When we recover Polybius, we find ourselves in the middle of negotiations between Euthydemus and a representative of Antiochus in early 206. Euthydemus reasoned that he should be allowed to retain his throne, for he never rebelled against the Seleucid house, and actually destroyed those who did referring to the Diodotids. He also pointed out the threat of the nomads on the Eurasian steppes, and argued that he was the only thing standing between the barbarians and the civilized Greeks. After mulling it over, Antiochus seems to have agreed with the sentiment, and ordered that a treaty be struck. Euthydemus was allowed to keep his throne as a vassal ruler, but was ordered to hand over all of his war elephants and supply the Seleucid army with grain. Installing Euthydemus as a client king was merely following his established precedent, as we saw in Media Atropatine, Armenia, and most recently in Parthia. Continuing the siege would have been costly, and after spending almost two years in Central Asia, Antiochus must have been concerned about the time he spent away from his imperial heartlands. Euthydemus may have been in no better position either, and if Antiochus believed the Bactrian king's claims, then having someone to secure the frontiers of his empire was a worthwhile investment. To formally ratify the treaty, Euthydemus sent his son Demetrius to the Seleucid camp. Antiochus was apparently impressed by the regal bearing of the young man, who in time would earn a reputation as a great conqueror in his own right, and formally offered one of his daughter's hands in marriage to solidify the pact between the Seleucid and Euthydemon houses. Whether he actually followed through on this promise is unclear. With Bactria under his authority, Antiochus turned south across the Hindu Kush in the summer of 206. In either the lands of Parupamisidae or Arachosia, he met with the local Indian ruler Sophagasinus. For most of the early Hellenistic period, India had been ruled by the Mauryan dynasty, whose empire had stretched throughout most of the Indian subcontinent and into southeast Afghanistan, where Antiochus was with his army. The Seleucid and Maurya royal houses held good relations throughout the 3rd century, but the empire of Chandragupta had severely contracted by the 200s, and it seems that Sophagasinus was either a breakaway ruler or a vassal king of some variety. Arachosia, for those that remember, was formerly a Seleucid territory given over to Chandragupta at the Treaty of the Indus, and was broadly considered as a part of India. Curiously, Polybius describes it as a renewal of their alliance, which implies they had contact prior to this meeting. It may have occurred during the time spent on the siege of Bactra, but it isn't obvious that the initial encounter was a hostile one, though Sophagasinus provided Antiochus with more elephants, grain, and a promised payment of treasure. After his meeting with the Indian lord, 
Antiochus marched west through Arachosia, leaving Afghanistan and following the coastline of southern Iran before reaching the region of Carmania. Here he spent the winter of 206-205 at the city of Antioch in Persis, as envoys from the city of Magnesia recorded their meeting with the king on an inscription. Carmania was directly adjacent to the Persian Gulf, a region that saw a large amount of Seleucid maritime activities, but one that experienced some turmoil previously. Based on our very scarce evidence, it seems that Antiochus spent his time either inspecting the Seleucid bases situated on the Gulf, or looking to secure the loyalty of, of the many local powers that dotted the area. The nearby satrapy of Persis had formally rebelled under the leadership of the corrupt governor Alexander in 222-220, and it is possible that he dealt with the rather mysterious Frateraka, a generalized grouping that refers to a series of Iranian officials who oscillate between either being Seleucid officials or semi-autonomous kings during the 3rd and 2nd centuries. The figure known as Wabars in Persian, or Orobasos in Greek, might have become a client king on the authority of Antiochus during his visit to the Gulf, but scholars remain deeply divided on the exact timeline of the Frateraka and where Wabars falls into this period. Snippets of Polybius' surviving narrative also reveal that Antiochus was sent a letter by the leaders of Gera, a prosperous mercantile town on the eastern coast of Arabia. In the message, which was apparently written in the Arabian dialect, the Geraeans pleaded with the king that they not lose their independence, a request which Antiochus respected. As a gift, the city provided him with 500 talents of silver and 1,200 talents worth of frankincense and myrrh. These were luxury commodities in the Mediterranean, and certainly Antiochus would prefer to foster a good trading relationship and funnel these goods, and the associated taxes, into his own empire rather than having them sell through that of the Ptolemies of the Red Sea. Antiochus then set sail for the island of Tylos, the modern kingdom of Borion, before traveling back through the northern mouth of the Gulf. From there, he returned to Babylon, where he took part in the Akitu New Year's Festival in April of 205, bringing his anabasis to a close after six years of continuous campaigning. Antiochus had seemingly done the impossible. After inheriting a broken and crumbling kingdom in 222 at the age of 19, the Seleucid king had destroyed the pretenders to his throne, marching from the Gaza Strip to northern Turkey to the edges of India, and forced several kings to bend the knee. His empire was once again the most powerful in the Hellenistic world, its borders restored to that of his ancestor Seleucus Nicator, a task that took 17 years of non-stop fighting to fulfill. On one hand, the need for an anabasis reveals an inherent weakness of Seleucid kingship, which compels the physical presence of the monarch to bind these distant lands under the banner of a single dynasty. Antiochus was a talented general and possessed the necessary motivation to campaign season after season to make it all work, but it was a difficult balancing act, even for him. To mitigate this problem, Antiochus installed several vassal rulers to act with his authority, but was this only a temporary solution? We may need not view Antiochus' achievements as a flash in the pan, as empires are able to expand and contract as needed. Subordinate kingdoms and buffer states may add to the prestige of an imperial power, as the Roman Empire and the Parthians would also utilize a similar methodology to great success. Following the completion of the Anabasis, Antiochus would from then on be known as Megas Antiochus, Antiochus the Great, the first Hellenistic ruler to use the epithet. Unlike Alexander, who was posthumously bestowed the title, Antiochus would adopt it within his own lifetime, as it appears on public inscriptions dating to the latter half of his reign. It may very well be the case that Antiochus preceded Alexander in its adoption, and it was universally used by authors of Greek, Roman, and Jewish background to singularly distinguish this Antiochus from the many that proliferated the dynasty. For instance, the author of 1 Maccabees refers to him as Antiochus the Great, King of Asia. It was a moniker intended to emphasize the imperial nature of Seleucid rule, a dominion that encompassed much of the known world, where Antiochus held numerous vassal rulers under his power. It seems that he also adopted the title Basileos Megas, Great King, which might be based on the Persian and Mesopotamian model. Accompanying this new image, Antiochus likely established a royal cult dedicated to himself, Laodike III, 
and presumably the rest of his dynasty, as surviving edicts extensively describes the organization of its priesthood. Following his return to Babylon, word of events that transpired in his absence will have reached his ears. The dominion of Ptolemy IV had been rocked by severe internal strife, as a massive revolt among his native Egyptian subjects effectively severed Upper Egypt from his control. This vulnerability could easily be exploited by Antiochus, who may have looked to finish what he had started back in 219, and finally reclaim Coeli Syria for his own. Yet in the distant west, the war between the Carthaginians and the Roman Republic was coming to a close, as Scipio Africanus was preparing to lead an invasion of North Africa. But as king of the world's largest empire, the ruler of untold millions, Antiochus had little to fear from these Italian barbarians, and should they ever cross paths, then he would crush them, as he had so many enemies before. <laughs> <laughs>